This week, we talk about the famous Alcacer murders of 1993. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Swerve Podcast. It's your co-host, Izzo, also joined here by Magnum. What's up, everybody? If you're a first-time listener of the podcast and you're wondering what you've stumbled across, we're the Swerve Podcast. We are two random dudes on a mission to understand everything in the universe, one obscure topic at a time. So our premise here is very simple. Every week we pick a topic, usually listener-recommended, something that swerves off the mainstream path, something that we don't really know anything about. Then we research it and discuss it on the fly during the podcast. So having said that, this week we're going to be talking about a pretty crazy episode, the Alcacer murders. But before we get into that, Izzo, I think you have some words. I do. I just want to quickly mention that we do have a Patreon. Yeah, okay. Simply put, there's two tiers. There's a $1 uh, Ride the Wave tier, and that'll give you access to the bonus episodes that we release each month, as well as you'll get the access to the library of episodes that we've released so far. You'll also get shout outs on the podcast. And then if you have a little bit more change, you can join the Slap the Ass tier for $3, and that'll give you all those bonus episodes, shout outs on the podcast, but you'll also receive all the episodes, both the main and Patreon, a few days before anyone else. So you'll receive them on Sundays rather than the typical drop time of Wednesdays. Hell yeah. Now, we do have a tradition on this podcast. Izzo, would you enlighten the listeners? Yes, of course. The tradition is that we like to drink on this podcast, and usually we take listener recommended drinks, maybe make some classic cocktails or keep it basic and we like to tell you what we're drinking for the episode maybe you can join along or give you some new ideas so we'll start off the round table with myself since it's a spanish inspired episode i'm drinking a cali moco so mirin jewel sent out the drink recommendation a while ago we've made it before it's delicious and uh made it again for this episode which is also recommended by Mirren Jewel. So a loyal listener, thank you for the drink recommendation and the topic recommendation as well. What about you? What do you have? So I have a Chilcano. This is a Pisco-based drink. It's very similar to a Moscow Mule, um, but you, you have fresh squeezed lime juice and ginger ale with your Pisco. It's fantastic. That sounds pretty good. Yes. To the listeners, we will post our drink recipes on our Instagram. So if you're interested in what we're going to be partaking in this episode, you can find those recipes on our Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. I don't know. Other than that, do we have anything else to say? Uh, yeah. Before we hop into the basics, just a trigger warning here. Uh, we're going to be talking about a case that involves sexual assault, ass assault and murder. So if you don't feel comfortable with these topics, you can uh, stop the recording now and Maybe listen to some of our more lighthearted episodes. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, let's let's hop into the basics here. Let's let's get into this one. All right. So the basics: the Alcacer or Alcacer murders, which is also known as the Alcacer girls case, refers to an incident that took place in Spain in 1992. So Alcacer is a small town in the Spanish province of Valencia. And it has a population of, you know, around 7,000 people and sits about 15 kilometers southwest of Valencia. So it's a small town among dozens on that countryside. And several small towns are separated by a kilometer or two, making them easy to walk between, which is actually important in the case. So the case involves the abduction, rape, and murder of three teenage girls, Miriam Garcia Ibora was 14, Antonia, Tony, Gomez, Rodriguez, who was 15, and Desiree Hernandez Folk, who was 14 as well, from the town of Alcacer. Okay, and now we'll get into the disappearance of them. So on the night of November 13th, 1992, so it was a Friday the 13th, the three girls went over <laughs> to their other friend's house, Esther, because they wanted to go to a popular nightclub cooler in the nearby town of Picassent where classmates of the girls were throwing a party. It was like a fundraiser effort to raise funds for the end-of-the-year class trip. But their friend Esther, who probably was the last person to really see them, uh, would, join, would not join them on this trip because she had the flu. And according to one of the girls, uh, Miram, her brother Martin Garcia, 
There's a Netflix documentary about this whole thing. It's like a five part docu series, but he uh, he says that Miriam called her parents from Esther's house to see if they could drive them to the club, but the mother said that the father was sick and feverish, so they couldn't uh, get a ride that night. And now, like to actually where they were going, so they were in Alcacer and they wanted to go to Pick Ascent, which is literally across a freeway. So it takes about a couple of minutes of driving between the towns or half an hour of walking. So it is like pretty close by. And instead of staying home, the girls they decide they would hitchhike to the club, which was like a common occurrence in Spain at the time where you just kind of hitchhike because places are so, so close to each other. Yeah. We should emphasize that because I mean, at least when I was first looking into this, when I was like, Oh, they're hitchhiking. I'm like, that's kind of crazy. Like, why would you be yeah. doing that? But, in the early nineties, especially between these small towns, like that was, yeah, that wasn't like weird. That was pretty normal. Yeah. So, and like 7,000 people in a town, it's one of those small towns where most people know each other or know somebody that knows them. So it's not as dangerous as maybe a large city would seem. Right. Uh, so in, yeah, instead of staying home, they decided to go out. They did hitchhike one ride from people that they knew that took them to a gas station outside of Picassent Town Center. So that was one thing that was confirmed. Another eyewitness testimony from a completely unrelated source came forward about a week or so after uh, they were reported missing. So it came from Maria Badal Soria, and she was a 63-year-old woman who saw the three girls walking by her home in Picassent, and she estimated the time to be roughly 8 p.m., which uh, kind of provides a cluttered timeline because there was a lot of eyewitness accounts and even Esther said everything kind of occurred around 8 p.m. So even this lady seeing them at 8 p.m. kind of muddies the timeline for things. But this older woman recalls seeing the girls get into a small four-door white sedan, even though they were just minutes away from the cooler nightclub. So they decide to get in this car even though they were almost at the nightclub. Mm. According to this eyewitness, there was already a few men inside the white sedan. She recalls at least three or four, which means there was really no space for the girls to go. But anyway, they got in what seems like out of their own free will into this car. And that's actually the last time they were ever seen alive. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. Yeah. So next, I I just wanted I had a couple things to say, but I'm wondering, do we talk about the father of one of the girls and like his his expedition into things or yeah like how he like really funds his own or like investigates by himself and like another guy maybe we'll save it we'll save it i just have yeah. some information so we'll okay. save it you continue so uh now we'll get to the part where we ac- they actually begin searching for the girls so the girls don't come home at their normal time of 10 p.m. and the parents start to worry so miram's father the one who was sick. The next day he drives to the club to look for them and he stops by a guard station, which is kind of like a police station to tell them his daughter is missing and the guard said there needs to be at least 24 hours before they can file an official missing person report. But then by Monday uh, of that weekend, everyone was concerned. Even the mayor had organized like a 12 car search party and there was posted flyers all around town, neighboring towns of these girls yeah i want to add something here yeah so because this is the early 90s that 24 hour thing because usually right it's just one of those things people are like well you know normally if in 24 hours it's you know they're usually they ran away for fun or they're like staying at a friend's house yeah so we wait 24 hours but that's like really not how things operate anymore like basically if you don't find someone within the first 24 hours it's like the chances that they're dead is extremely high right so like when someone's reported missing it's like i don't know at least in canada like we get like amber alerts and shit like immediately it's like not there's no like waiting it's like we need to go right now kind of everything's treated like what what would you say like a kidnapping or like a like a serious life and death situation so i think that's also different here and maybe that played a role in um fuck what happened right because you just weren't acting fast enough. Yeah. I mean, they have like whole shows like the first 48 where it's like, if you don't really get anything within the first 48 hours, you probably won't find the people alive. There's still like, you can find the case can be solved like decades later, but it's like, yes, the initial 48 hours are probably 
pretty important in a missing person's case. Yeah, like the survi- chance of survival decreases precipitously yeah. as hours pass. So I just want to make that note. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so Fernando Garcia, who was Miriam's father, he turns to the media right away and it starts getting like unprecedented levels of coverage. So he's like hounding the media. He's like, the only way to get like to find them safely is to start talking about it in the media. So this was really one of the first times that the Spanish media focused on a story and it just grew to like the levels that we see most stories grow grow to now, but this was like the first case in yeah in Spain. I want to insert something now, but we'll talk more about it later as things come up. But Fernando Garcia, this this is the father that you're talking about here. He actually like quit his job to like track down where these girls are, like kind of like taken style. Yeah. Like he like literally pulled like a Liam Neeson shit and he's just, I will find you. And like went out to like find these girls. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And he was like out of the parents of the missing girls. He was the one that really was the face of like speaking to the media. So he organized it. He spoke to them the most. He even like at some point went to London to like get Europe wide coverage on this story. Yeah. And I just want to insert another thing here. We'll we'll bring it up as we get through the story. But like he did believe that this these murders that we'll get into were like a police coordinated cover up. Yeah. And he has like all this shit about that. But let's just yeah. continue where we are. By the end, uh, we'll we'll get to that point. Uh, so the civil guard or the police force they began utilizing their usual tricks after the weekend by hitting up any local offenders who had been recently released from jail in Picasent and Alcacer. When this turned up with nothing, they expanded their search to include anyone in the surrounding area and had a police record. Again, this turned up nothing. And then in December of 1992, the search for the three girls continued to expand in size and scope, and it managed to make its way all the way up to the president of the Spanish government, Felipe Gonzalez. So on Christmas Eve of 1992, he hosted the families of the three missing girls, heard their pleas promising to attribute more forces to the search in hopes of a quick resolution. Uh, And this was like a televised event, of course. So the search expanded to neighboring nations, even neighboring continents. And it was presented to like Interpol, who began to like look at other countries in Europe and Africa for suspects of this case. Mm -hmm. But this is like a month later. And at this point, we've already mentioned it, but Fernando Garcia quit his job and was pursuing answers full time. And over the next month, he was planning to visit multiple news agencies across the country, including the BBC and Sky News. Uh, He was even trying to arrange face to face meetings with the Pope in an effort to spread the story of the three girls to churches and chapels around the world. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of crazy because like the Catholic Church, if they know anything about pedophile rings. Yeah, they can. There you go. Like probably not the best place to go. Let's get the Pope involved. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay. That's crazy. It's funny. And then finally, we're going to get into like the discovery of the bodies. Uh, so more than two and a half months later, the bodies are discovered on January 27th, 1993, in a rural area of La Romana by two beekeepers, That's Gabriel fucking Gonzalez nuts. Yeah, and uh, Jose Sala. And this place was 37 kilometers south of Alcacer. So these these beekeepers, this is what this is what I just want to say something here about these beekeepers. <clears throat> so they find these bodies and we'll get into what they find. But one thing that's crazy is the police allowed the two beekeepers to collect evidence at the scene. Yeah. What the fuck? In what world does that make any sense? These beekeepers, like, you have this huge, this is now an international news, right? Because there's other countries that are reporting on this. Interpol's involved. And you have, like, these two fucking beekeepers find the bodies. And the police, instead, like, right, instead of, like, I don't know, sending forensics, they're like, oh, you guys just handle it. Snap some photos. It's fine. No? No, it's, uh... It's fucking crazy. The whole case is like shrouded in like these weird things that happen that just never really get a resolution for it. And that's why I guess these murders are so talked about. And like even there's like five 
part docuseries because there was so many shenanigans that occurred with the case and we'll get into some of them. But yeah, it is pretty weird that these beekeepers yeah. just were allowed to be there and like help out where everyone else wasn't. I think there was one photo of the like the the where the bodies were found. Like they didn't they didn't take photos like before collecting anything. There was just yeah. like one photo. <laughs> there was there was like one photographer and his daughter that came and they were like taking pictures from the outside and then as soon as like they got close and people saw them they like weren't allowed in and stuff was confiscated right but they they were they were able to like keep a few pictures that they snapped so there is like a few pictures of like all these policemen and maybe even the beekeepers there just like handling the evidence before it officially gets documented yeah but yeah, well, one of the well, that's the thing. A lot of it got tossed out too, which I'm sure we'll mention. Yeah. But and that's because I well, a lot of it got tossed out, destroyed, or mm-hmm. just lost. They're like, yeah. oh, we just conveniently lost. It. lost. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, yeah. But the actual story of the discovery. So one of the beekeepers, Gabriel, he was walking around the property, and something shiny catches his eye, and it kind of looks like a watch. But he freaks out and calls for Jose. So they find this watch on the ground covered by branches and debris. And this watch is like a Mickey Mouse watch, which was later uh, revealed to be like one of the girl Tony's watches. Mm. But they see this watch and it, it's attached to what looks like forearm bones. So they call the authorities at that point. So the authorities, the local magistrate, which is like the judge or the bailiff, uh, Jose Bort made it to the area along with his judicial secretary, Angeles Collado. So this is relevant because Angeles Collado, she would become uh, the judge that would oversee the trial of the case's main suspect. So there could be like conflict of interest there. Uh, it's also worth noting that on January 27th, when the bodies were discovered, the Ministry Interior decided to replace the team in charge of the finding the girls so they replaced the local task force with a national task force called the uco so on that day that they found them they sent the local task force back and we're still waiting from for the uco to arrive yeah which is kind of weird okay but it say just, that again i missed i missed the importance of that okay so the importance is like on the day that they were found the local task force that had been like doing this case for two and a half months that particular day they're sent back to lake valencia and a new team, like a national team, the UCO, uh, oh, was so sent from Madrid. Out. Yeah, a team that like didn't wasn't as familiar with the case. Yeah, and the UCO, okay. they weren't present in the area when the bodies were found, so it took them like hours to get to the area. Whereas the local task force was pretty much already there, but they just weren't allowed to go in. And mm-hmm. the excavation of the bodies occurred without the supervision of the UCO, so they had like just random people and beekeepers there it was fucking beekeepers ex- excavating fucking dead bodies yeah and like other just like maybe local people i think even like uh <laughs> like, like a just like some homeless guy no there was like a mortician already there like as well for these He's bodies, like handing out like, business cards like a fuck yeah but yeah that Here's was my business card that was super weird of it too that's yeah so after they dig up the area they found find three bodies and they identify them as the girls that had been kidnapped, raped, and tortured. And also, interestingly, at least two were allegedly decapitated. Yeah, it's the decapitation one when I was researching it. I think it's it was hard to say if it was legit, like decapitation, or if it was from decay. Yeah. So I don't know if that 100% was solved. But like, they were all shot. They had like bullet wounds. Yep. Some of their hands were sawed off and like some of the hand, like they weren't recovered. No, there it was, was just some... only one girl whose like right hand was never found. Yeah. And a lot of like there's stab wounds and vaginal yep. wounds as well. Like it was yeah, pretty, we'll, we'll get into it all. Crazy. But the other important thing about this case, we've kind of mentioned before, but there was nobody at the crime scene or nobody at the crime scene took photos of it as they like got there. The only photos that were taken were after the excavation occurred. So there is no evidence of like them actually doing it. It's just like after they had the bodies, they took maybe like one picture of the bodies and all the evidence they found, they didn't photograph it where it was found, 
they collected everything and just kind of laid it out on the ground and then took a picture. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's, that's what I was saying. Like from my research that I looked into, I think there was one photo, like one photo of things before they were tampered with. Yeah. And that's, that's it. And it's just like, it's like a beekeeper. I don't even know what it is. Like there wasn't even like, you don't even have cell phones. Like what kind of photo is this? Like, well, even in the photo, <laughs> it just looks like a pile of dirt and there's like a few yeah. pieces of clothing in it. And that's, that's it. It's it's completely inadequate yeah. for a case of this magnitude. Normal, no, normal police p- procedure throughout the world is like you take photographs of everything you find and like mark it down. And They're like, well, let's just get the beekeepers on it. Yeah, the other thing was uh, <laughs> that happened is like it was hours before they taped off the scene and they didn't really have a record of like who was there before. So it, it took them like hours to like excavate it. And then mm. it was like walled off for from anyone, which is also kind of weird. But uh, also near the bodies, they found other items like a glove, binoculars, three belts, and clothing items. They also found papers scattered in the bran- branches. Yeah, they weren't sure if this was before, like it wasn't found in the pit, but this particular form was found just in the area, and it was from Enrique Angeles who had been treated at the Lafay Hospital in Valencia for STDs. So they found yeah. this form with a name on it, and that's kind of what they used to well, track down Enrique, and they arrested him and several others in his apartment that day that they found the bodies, including this guy, Miguel Ricart, who was known as the Blonde. <laughs> yeah, that's that was an important finding, that because really – they didn't have any leads until they had that piece of paper that had a name on it. Yeah. Which is crazy. Cause like this fucking dumbass, he's just like carrying around his like STD test. Like, what are you, what are you doing, Matt? Like what? Yeah. But also like, like, I better get rid of it. There's, there's some people that think that <laughs> was it positive? Paper wasn't, uh, yeah, it was, he like had a venereal <laughs> disease, but they don't really say what it was. <laughs> But the thing is, like, the wind could have carried it there. It wasn't like it was found with the bodies. It was just in the area, and that's the only sure. thing that they had. So then sure, but... they just went and investigated. Another mistake that was made for the evidence collecting uh, was they were putting wet evidence immediately into plastic bags where they would sit for hours or even days. And this is not normal as well because wet evidence that's sealed tends to grow bacteria and mold that can damage evidence forever. Yeah. So that was also well, I think a they did. I think there was evidence that was destroyed and maybe that ties into that fact. Yeah. So probably. All right. So now what I want to do is like talk about the suspects cuz they really only had two people that they kind of attacked for this. So the first was that Enrique Angeles guy uh, that had the STD form. So they first interrogated him. He said he killed the girls because he was in the nightclub and they didn't want to dance with them. But then authorities realized his story didn't add up and Enrique appeared to be slow mentally and his family said that he was schizophrenic. So police began to focus their attention instead on his brother Antonio Angeles, who authorities believe had borrowed his brother's social security documents. And then he like left him there. Yeah, I think Antonio Angles, this guy's brother, he was actually like known to the police. Like he was involved in like some shenanigans here and there. Yeah, we'll get into so, it too. Yeah. So like even his own family describes an Antonio as a very violent man and his sister Kelly, she says that she didn't think her brother could feel any empathy for people and he was very cold and that everyone in the family was pretty much afraid of him. It was a big family, so it was like Antonio had eight other siblings and like not the best living conditions. But between 1985 and 1991, Antonio, he was in prison on like five different occasions for a variety of crimes involving stealing, drug drug trafficking, and robbery with like a weapon. But one crime in 1991 was kidnapping and imprisonment charges when he kidnapped and beat a junkie who stole a bag of heroin from him that he was planning on selling. So for this particular crime in 1991, he was sentenced to six years in prison. Also, during this, like, 1991 case, the guy that they do have in custody, Miguel Ricard, he was also uh, charged with aiding and abetting in that 
kidnapping and imprisonment. Okay. But yeah, so after a year of serving his sentence, Antonio was released on a six-day permit in on March 5th, 1992. So they just like let him out of jail, even though he was supposed to serve five more years <laughs> with the intention that he would come back, but he never did. So they released him on six days and he just left. So he essentially became uh, an escaped convict. Right. And the other weird part about this story is there was no arrest warrant issued for another six months. So in September, so he left, he didn't come back. And then the police waited six months in order to like issue an arrest warrant for him. Yeah, that's that's just great. Well, I mean, it just goes into the incompetence bucket yeah. for this episode. Like, your fucking forensics team is like two beekeepers, and <laughs> like you know, like it's the mortician, like the local mortician guy. He's like, oh, yeah, better buy, better buy your coffin. Here's my business card, and it's like, what the fuck is going on here? Yeah. And then now you have the police. They let the what did he? How many? How long did he actually serve? Just like a year. Yeah, he serves, so he serves, like, nothing. Yeah. And actually with this, so the families actually sue the Spanish government on this specific account of, like, them releasing him on a six-day permit because it's written there that he did have this permit. And each family from this specifically was granted, like, 300 euros or 300,000 euros for this, for their, like, part. Because if he was never released, uh, they would have never ended up being murdered by him, allegedly. But it right, also could yeah. just lead to, like, the cover-up. So we'll get into, like, the cover-up in the shenanigans, but essentially the Spanish government, it didn't go to trial. It was, like, settled outside of court that they were just, like, paid this amount for their blunder. Right. Yeah. And actually, okay. still to this day, Antonio Angles remains on Spain's most wanted list decades after the crimes were committed. He's also never been found, ever. He just, like, kept no. evading like police searches and stuff like that. So with this in mind, with Antonio kind of disappearing, they focus on Miguel Ricard, who had often Here, wanna, been seen with Antonio. I want to jump in while we're, because we're mentioning yeah. Antonio and how he's still, I have, I have some notes where like, they actually tried to arrest him a couple times. So one time, like he escaped. Did you find this? He like jumped through a window and like, yeah. he like got away on foot or some shit. Like, that's like, like alleged. It's alleged, but like he, so he like hops through a window, escapes on foot from the police. Like this is this is the police. They're working with beekeepers, and like they just like can't get this guy. He just jumps through a window, gets away. And then this was another thing I found because he's on the most, the most wanted list. He was like spotted getting his hair styled. <laughs> like yeah. literally, he's like getting. It didn't even say like a haircut. Like I think he's like getting it curled or something or like permed. I don't know what he's doing. He's getting it dyed. styled. He's getting it dyed. And then, like, Apparently, they're like, yeah. oh, shit, Antonio's getting his haircut. Let's go get him. And then he flees again on foot and, like, escapes the police. And I'm just, like, trying to picture this. I'm like, you know how, like, when, you know, like, someone carries a football and they're, like, juking to, like, get around, like, the yeah. defense? I'm picturing this guy, like, juking and, like, he's, like, got his perm or whatever the fuck and, like, or his dyed hair or whatever it is. Just, like, you know, just, like, this bullshit police chase where it's, like, I don't know. It's like wacky music being played, and it's like the beekeepers, <laughs> like, like get the beekeepers in. It's like, yeah, it's crazy. And then not only that, I want to add another thing. He was reported to have entered a shipping crate and used that shipping crate to flee to Dublin. Yeah, and then they're like, apparently, there was like someone caught wind of this or something. So and so he they wouldn't be able to get him. He like jumped off the ship into the sea and like swam away yeah. and he's never been found <laughs> that's that's the story he's yeah. never been found so it's like a, a you know like a hollywood fucking sitcom or something like just yeah like catch me if you can but that's the thing it's like this story of antonio just escaping it's like he was just like some low life drug addict from like a small town in spain and then he becomes this elusive mastermind like, that just never gets it doesn't caught. add up it doesn't yeah. add up no but uh so th allegedly that like jump from the window fourth story window so the same night that the bodies it were was found four stories yeah the same night that it was found they like raided his house arrested like all his siblings and miguel ricard was also there because you know he was a family friend so he was there all the time some say that he was living there but apparently like as soon as the raid happened the story is 
uh, Antonio jumped out of the fourth story window. But there was like cops all over the house because they were planning like if the, he was to escape, they would catch him. So that's why it's like alleged like, oh, yeah, he just jumped before we had a chance to catch him. But yeah, essentially the story of Miguel Ricard. So he was friends he with have, Antonio. Like, fucking titanium legs or something? Like, how do you not? Yeah. Jesus Christ. Allegedly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the two uh, have been known on police radars. They would engage in small petty crimes. Miguel would have two brief minor stints in jails in 1992 for like illegal use of motor vehicles. So just like GTA, I guess. Mm. But yeah, both jail bids only lasted less than three weeks. But they were on the police radar, both Miguel and Antonio. So Miguel was essentially a small-time criminal who stole cars to supply his delinquent lifestyle and drug habits. Uh, so the night that they catch Ricard, he placed himself at the crime scene and named Antonio as the culprit of the murders. So Ricard would go on to make a series of like statements and declarations about that night. And in his first one, he doesn't admit to seeing Antonio at all in the preceding months. He said the two men had been friends over decades, but he didn't know where Antonio was and hadn't seen him in quite some time. He did admit that Antonio was an aggressive man and may have had mental issues that could make him a danger to others. So that was his very first statement. And then the bodies are found, and then his statements just keep changing well, as let more me add, evidence comes he, up. He fucking, this Miguel Ricard guy, throughout the entire series of these events, I think he's, he changed his confession and statement six times yeah like in total so like let's keep that in mind here so like he's coming out and he's like oh antonio did it but like this flip-flops like six times so we'll just keep that in mind as we go through this because it's 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 pretty crazy like i don't even know what to believe from this guy Before we continue the episode, if you are enjoying our murder podcast, the people you hang out with probably will too. Do us a solid and please pass on this episode to your social media friends on Facebook, Twitter, or other platforms. We would definitely appreciate your support. I'd also like to take this time to shout out some of our valued listeners. Shout out to Alexis, Miranda Rani, Jay, the mother of Command Cats, and Caleb Moyers for the messages and interactions on Instagram. Also, shout out to Emma Don, Susan McDonald, and Dana for engaging on Facebook. Lastly, shout out to our newest Patreons, Show Me Your Guts, Tyler Davis, Jerry McClellan, and Stephanie Singletary. Coming in at that slap the ass tier, I hope you all enjoy the exclusive content and shiny stickers. To everyone else, please feel free to submit your topic or drink recommendations at www.theswervepodcast.com. May good karma and vibes be with you all. Back to the show. Well, you can't really take his statements. Like the very first time the cops question him, he's like, I, I had nothing to do with it. He doesn't like try and run away from the cops. Like he's just in the house and he's like, oh, like I don't know where Antonio is. I haven't seen him in years. And then as the bodies are discovered and like more evidence comes out, each single time the cops have a better story of what happened, Miguel Ricard's story changes as well to like mm -hmm. match up with what the police had. So even like the police, they're like, okay, now we have this information. His statement changes like 24 hours after that information. Right. But yeah, they uh, see that there's some like inconsistencies in Miguel's story and it proves him as, as being involved in the case. So they didn't believe that he wasn't aware of Antonio's whereabouts. Also, Miguel said that he was in jail the night of the kidnappings, but this couldn't be proven because they just like lost documentation or they didn't have any records of him being in jail. <laughs> so that's also like a weird, weird thing. Like Miguel saying, like, I was in jail that day. And they're like, well, according to our records, you weren't. You were released like a day before. Or you weren't even right. in our system. Like his month. alibi didn't didn't make yeah didn't couldn't be corroborated yeah also like Miguel does have a white Opel Corsa, which matches the description of the vehicle they had been searching for, so they felt comfortable enough pressuring him for information and actually like arresting him that night. Mm. But then he's like officially interrogated after the autopsies of the bodies, and that's where his statement kind of changes. In his fourth 
statement. So he's already changed his story three other times, but in the fourth one, he eventually says that they picked up the teens as they were hitchhiking, and when they drove past the clubs, the girls started to like fight them. Antonio turned around, hit one of the girls in the mouth with a gun, knocking out her teeth, which lines up with mm. the autopsy reports. Right. Miguel says he has nothing to do with it, and he was scared of Antonio. He just kind of went along with it. Uh, in according to the statements, they took them to a hut nearby where they tied them up and sexually assaulted them. Then they left to get sandwiches at a place. That was weird. Yeah, in returned story. back to the incident, continued sexually abusing them, and then uh, they killed them. So, like, they were going back to the car, and Antonio just takes out a gun, pulls the trigger. There's, like, shell casings left there. One of the story, like, one of the pieces of evidence is, like, there was a unshot bullet, so it was, like, a fully loaded bullet they found in one of the girls' hands. So, like, now Miguel's story, like, matches up to that, where it's, like, oh, yeah, he, like, tried shooting one. It didn't go off. He changed it. That's why there's a full bullet on the ground. But then, like, the next four sh- or three shots were, like, deadly, and he shot each girl in the back of the head. Uh, and then just kind of threw them in a pit that they had dug there, and then just rolled them up in a carpet and threw them in the pit and threw dirt on top of it and branches and stuff. It's fucking crazy. But uh, along with this, so Miguel would later uh, deny his involvement in the crimes. So he would he said that he'd been beaten and coerced by authorities for this story. And this was like in trial or like when he was outside of control of these like local policemen. They said that they had him like detained for 24 hours before his first or before his second statement. So the first one he was he didn't know anything about it. The second one is when he all of a sudden places himself at the crime and Antonio. But there was like 24 hour period before those two statements where he was probably like beaten and coerced and tortured and told what to say as evidence emerged. Is there is there merit to that? Like, was he actually? Because I, I did read that, but I didn't dig into it. Like, do you think he actually was, like, one at least one of his statements was coerced? Yeah, I, I, I definitely believe that he was coerced into that statement. Okay. Like, they pretty much took, like, a low life and just made him uh, admit to the crimes. Also, apparently, one of the one of the doubts or the things that places doubt in this story is a lot of people say that Antonio Angeles, like the guy that actually murdered these girls was gay. So according to his friends that and family, sense. like he was gay and he didn't want to like, he had no interest in like having sex with these girls. Right. But then the cops, they took this piece of information and transformed it into, Oh, he hated women. So that's why he did this to them. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But yeah, that's essentially what we're saying here is each time new evidence came out, Miguel's version of the story and his confession would change to fit exactly what the police thought had had happened. (laughs) It's so crazy, though. Like, the story changed so many times. It's just like, (laughs) I don't even know what to say. It's like, they're like, He's like, no, 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 this time, this is what happened. This is what happened. This is serious. I'm serious this time. This is what happened. And they're like, well, what about this and this? And he's like, okay, 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 okay. I'm serious this time. Like, this time, this is what happened. Like, Sans may be the one that's coerced because he gets the shit beat out of him. That could be anything, right? If that's true. Like, I, I you know, if you're being tortured, it's like you can get people to say anything. Yeah. So, but the other ones are, it's just very weird. Well, like, the other ones it's very could weird. also be coerced. Like, he's in jail by these local authorities so like each time they get new piece of information, they go back to him and they're like, hey, if you don't comply with us right now, well, we're going to like torture you some more, or like kill your family or whatever. So then that's why he keeps complying because he's still in their custody this whole time. He's I in see. custody for like four years until he actually goes to trial and is sentenced. But yeah, during that whole time, he, he just becomes like a puppet. So whatever they need, he just kind of agrees to it. And then it's only like when he's outside of their control, like when he's already in the trial and uh, that's when he says, like, yeah, they made me say all this stuff. So it's 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 basically, if I'm understanding, he's he's essentially a scapegoat in yep. this is and they believe that Antonio is the culprit. 
but he's the most elusive man on the planet, apparently. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's like, you fucking can't get, he's like literally in like a hairdressing chair with like a cape on and yeah. you can't fucking arrest him. And he's managed <laughs> to like trek thousands of kilometers, mostly on foot. He's crossed international borders. Um, he made it onto a boat to like Ireland. <laughs> yeah all while being like on Europe's most wanted criminal list with versions yeah. of his face, like plastered all over the media and all over Europe. You know, it'd be well. crazy if he's like, he's like in Ireland, like working as a beekeeper now or some shit. Yeah. So he's like, always got that white suit on and his face is like covered. He's like, I'm a beekeeper now in Ireland. Working with the Pope. <laughs> I don't even know. Anyways, okay, where are we in the story? So they're beating... Miguel's like a scapegoat. Antonio's all over the map. Yeah, what? and that's essentially all we have to say there. One other thing to mention about Miguel's stories is it comes out that he actually did have an alibi for the night in question. So on November 13th, Miguel was spotted at a bar getting dinner with some other with another man. And this made its way into the third confession. So when the police found out um, that Miguel had been here, that's when the police story changed to, yeah, after like these guys kidnapped the girls, they went and got sandwiches after. So because he had an alibi for his night, the police changed their story to like make it fit with uh, Miguel's presence. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, okay. uh, yeah, so and that even, was like, them getting sandwiches. Yeah, that was why that was inserted. But like Miguel says, he was at that restaurant like 7 p.m. So before the girls even went missing. And like the bar owner first like said, oh, yeah, like Miguel was there. But then they like denied any involvement in the trial and like never showed up for him. Probably like paid off or something. But yeah, that's the huh. that's the story as well there. So, like, as more information is revealed, his story changes. And even, like, his alibi is, like, worked into the plot of the murder as well. I see. Okay. So, it sounds like there's a lot of shenanigans going on. Yeah. They also uh, say that Antonio, because he wasn't able to perform, he used, uh, like, branches and stuff. And that's why there are so many wounds around that area like stab wounds and stuff oh, so jesus was, yeah um but yeah the restaurant that they went to was called el parador where they went and got snacks and drinks the bar owner says that he does remember miguel coming in there or the, that's what the bar owner's statement was after the police mm -hmm. had a chance to him is that miguel came in here at what seemed like 10 or 11 o'clock at night and and grabbed food and sandwiches and stuff to go Okay, um, which is different than Miguel saying like I was there at seven just with this other guy having dinner. So the right. bar owner's actual story changed, and then he just wasn't around for the trial, so he never confessed to any of this. Um, the other thing to note about this story is from the autopsies, they've gathered that uh, the girls had suffered a period of time before their deaths, like multiple hours, even days before they actually died. Um, not just like an hour or two after disappearing. So that part of the story is also cloudy. So the official story is it was like a few hours where all of this happened all in the same night. But the autopsy like has evidence that it was days before they were killed because they didn't find the bodies for like two and a half months afterwards. Right. Okay. Uh, also, another part of the story that is still kind of cloudy um, is the abandoned farmhouse that was uh, allegedly where the torturing and the rape of the girls happened was very close to the road, but the bodies uh, where the girls were buried was over a kilometer away from that spot. And there was like treacherous terrain. It was very steep, very difficult and impossible to navigate in the dark. Not only that, like you have to take three, other people with you in the middle of the night. So that part of the story is also kind of weird. I see. Also, if you're wondering 
about the autopsies. Usually they're filmed, but for these autopsies, the first one and the second one that was done like a day later, they don't really have video for it. So they don't have the full video of the autopsy. And in court, they just presented like a 20 minute highlight of the autopsies. So the rest of the footage is just lost. Yeah, that's wild. So at the end of this, Miguel Ricard, he was sentenced to trial. He was found guilty and he was sentenced to 170 years in prison for his role in the murders, although he was later released in 2013. You know, I don't understand that shit. Yeah. Like, what's with everybody? They get sentenced for something, but like, it's like not really sentenced. Well, apparently with this one, there was protests in Spanish government or whatever that nobody should lawfully serve more than 30 years in prison just because you know they're humans too i guess so he served (laughs) he served that time like 20 something years and then they let him go so it wasn't just him but like a bunch of murderers were just set free in 2013 i see it so it's just like some shit yeah i think in canada we have something similar like a life sentence is 25 years yeah yeah like doesn't even make sense like you're sentenced to life and it's like 25 years anyways yeah what i want to do now is just talk about maybe we might cut this part but the actual like discovery of the bodies okay uh so the bodies were examined in order of their discovery so the first body was that of tony um she had the watch on that the that the beekeeper saw Uh, She was also one of the two bodies that was found without the head attached, leading to people thinking that it might have been decapitation. However, there's other theories to support that, you know, maybe it wasn't, maybe it was decay, maybe it was the way they handled the bodies, etc. Right. So she was found with her arms behind her back, and she was wearing that watch, leading to the discovery of the bodies. They discovered that her body showed signs of rape, but her hymen was still intact. Um, But essentially, doctors quickly identified her cause of death as a gunshot wound to the skull. Then they moved on to the second body, which was that of Desiree Hernandez. Uh, Her head was also found detached from her body. And the other interesting thing to note here was uh, they didn't find socks on her where uh, Tony did. So even her family found this as odd. Um, And the thing that shocked everyone was Desiree's nipples had been removed with what what looked like a blunt prying object so pliers and this was presumably done by the killers which implies some greater level of sadism that is present in most uh, opportunistic killings holy fuck yeah she was also killed with a gunshot wound to the head and also they found stab wounds on her torso and the third body was that of miriam garcia and she was found without socks as well She was missing the right hand, which investigators have never recovered. And unlike the other victims, she had suffered some sort of beating at the hands of the captor because she was missing uh, multiple teeth. What's the deal with the missing? Why does that keep being mentioned all the time? Because the others, um, they didn't look like they were beaten, but her specifically, she was. And if you recall from like Miguel's fourth confession, he says that like the girl started fighting back and Antonio took the gun and hit one of them in the face, which lines up to, like, missing teeth. Oh, no, I understand the missing teeth, but what's the deal with the missing socks? They're like, oh, they were found without socks. They were found without socks. Like, why is that a detail that's being said in these reports? Uh, It makes it seem like there was more of a struggle when they were kidnapped, essentially. So maybe they didn't get in the car, but, you know, they were fighting like socks come off when they fight uh, i don't know you know but that's that's one of the <laughs> stories okay yeah oh, i was just curious because it's mentioned in all the r- reports and i'm like okay i don't get it but okay <laughs> so the other thing about miriam garcia's was her genitals showed signs of various rips and tears produced mm. after her death so this is again a result oh. of a sick violent person yeah, yeah. like some necrophilia shit All right, so after that gruesome discovery, we'll get into some of the doubts of the story. So we've littered a few of them throughout, you know, as we bring it up, bring them up. But uh, here are some more. So Miriam's father, Fernando Garcia, who we've mentioned before, he doubts authorities' version of the entire crime, calling Miguel Ricard just a pawn. 
So he began his own investigation, which he believes showed evidence that the girls were killed or tortured by high-ranking officials who kidnapped girls for their own pleasure. And in September 1996, uh, Fernando Garcia gained access to the police case files, which he detailed the investigation from beginning to end. He shared those files with Juan Blanco, who was a criminologist, and the two began to understand the intricacies of the case. They realized that the police had nothing on Miguel Ricard other than some circumstantial evidence that didn't amount to much and confessions that Miguel claims were coerced. So they start actually yeah. looking through this stuff and making it like almost publicly available. I think they also, I'm sure we'll get into it, but they, like, they're they criti- critical of the police work that's been done up to this point, which is yeah. fair enough, as we've already discussed. But they do request like a second autopsy which gets performed by guys named Louis Frontinella, and they find DNA evidence of five perpetrators yep. in that, which is kind of crazy. And I think there was another spin on this that was taken. There was a like a cross inside of one of the bodies, like a. So they were thinking that, like, because of this, this is a religious symbol that this could be like a satanic ritual crime. So there was like some kind of spin mm. on that. Did you see any of that? No, I didn't. Uh, I didn't actually see that. Yeah. So that's there's. So not only I don't. I'm not saying the father thinks that, but some people were saying because that came up in this invest this like secondary investigation that's going on that like maybe there was that tie to that as well, like these high officials or something. Interesting. Yeah. Kind of crazy. No, I didn't see that, but that that is interesting. Um, also, uh, so what Fernando wanted to do was before Miguel's trial, he was adamant that they should delay the trial and broaden the scope of the in- investigation. Fernando didn't believe that Miguel Ricard and Antonio Ingles had acted alone in this crime. He was still sh- unsure if they were like guilty of it or like had a part to play, but he theorized that they were part of something bigger. So he was asking for like a delay until like new DNA evidence could uh, potentially be provided because at the time, like DNA evidence was just making its way into the courtroom. So he wanted to like give people more time to find that, but he was like denied and the trial went ahead and Miguel was sentenced or whatever. Um, But yeah, either way, Fernando Garcia is confident that police were not looking at the whole story. And so he actually expensed this himself, um, his investigation And in the months between January and July of 1997, Fernando appeared on various TV shows and radio programs, accompanied by Juan Blanco, the criminologist, and the two spoke freely about their ideas about the case, uh, whether or not if Miguel is guilty. Um, But yeah, they were just trying to get more uh, input and like make this a bigger story. Um, Yeah. Based on like all these uh, radio shows and stuff, they were actually like charged by government officials of like falsely yeah, they were charged for slander yeah slander essentially and they had to like pay out thousands of euros yeah, and- we should we should mention that because this basically we have the official investigation which we've talked about and there's like this secondary investigation that's being pursued by the father rightfully so right you want to figure out what's going yeah. on but you have this criminologist that blanco guy come in they they have the second autopsy they find these other culprits um I don't even like their names don't even matter because like we'll get into the slander case in a second, but they called this group of people, the L clan de la mort Leja. And I don't know what that means. Mm. And I probably butchered the pronunciation, but they were saying that there was this group that had been involved in this. And that group of people that goes into what you just said, they, they were like, we didn't fucking do anything. And they actually tr- sued them for slander and they won the case. Yeah. So this side of the story, although this was like a secondary investigation, I actually don't buy it. I don't think that there was this extra group of high ranking officials that um, were involved, if that makes sense. And okay. they, they, they already, they went to actual trial over this and they, they, they had to pay out cause they were wrong. I mean, and maybe I don't know the intricacies. Yeah, but hey, or if this is like a higher level entire government cover up, it goes even higher. Yeah, like <laughs> they could throw out the case because they don't have anything on them. Like the whole point of 
that kind of led to that was they found like 15 hair follicles on the bodies. First of all, like the actual autopsy, they washed the bodies before we should they say performed that. Yeah. 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 So they so like the, destroyed so the, evidence there. It's so bad. That's the word. Like, how do you even your DNA evidence at that point is like, I don't even know. Like you, yeah. you had such a good opportunity to collect samples and, but they totally yeah. fucked there was, it. There was so many things of like DNA that they could have collected that they didn't like the carpet. They the carpet would have had like blood and semen from there. They didn't collect yeah. that. They found hair follicles that they tried to test and it showed that there was like several people involved, like the DNA didn't match and the yeah. actual DNA from those hair follicles didn't match uh, like Antonio's mother, mother's DNA. So they're like, okay, it's not his DNA either. Mm. I want to add one more thing while we're on this Fernando Garcia's and the Blanco thing. Yeah. So th th that group of five people, the El Clan de la Mor Leja, one of the guys in that, he was like a film producer and uh, two of the guys actually. And one of them was like a CEO of like this company and they like do like film production. So part of the other theory was that like this group had done like a snuff film and the girls yeah. were just the victims. So this is this is like the secondary investigation that went on that led to that slander case that, you know, they won. They were like, well, you actually did just make this up. But that was kind of a big theory. And it wasn't clear what was true at the time. But one thing I, I also want to add, when I was looking into this, uh, it uh, you know, it seemed to me like the reason I, this I didn't buy this secondary story is because there's a lot of parties involved in that secondary story that like are f like a for-profit kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? Like they're like, oh, buy this book, buy this. And like, here's mm -hmm. this take. This is what happened. It seemed like at some point, I don't think Fernando Garcia, like the father, like, was do I think he really just wanted to get to the bottom of things, but I think people attached themselves to him and his story, and they kind of like used it as a way to like market this crazy. Oh, this is actually what happened, and like make money on it while slandering people who actually weren't involved. That's kind of my take on it, based on what I was looking at. Yeah, that could be. I don't true. know if you saw any of that stuff, but yeah, I did. Uh, like see that allegedly there was a snuff video that shows. Uh, I think it was Desiree being like abused and tortured by like several people that have never been identified. But I don't think there was a video. It was no. just like, it was like, they were like, this is maybe what they were doing, but there like yeah. never was any evidence for that theory. So. Yeah. Apparently like the criminologist Juan Blanco, he was provided a copy of the tape and he sent that to the like governments and it just oh, didn't right. go anywhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was the thing. He's like, I have the tape, but like, no one had, like, I just, it, I don't know. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like one of those things. It's like UFO shit. It's like, oh, I know UFOs are real. I have the tape. And it's like, hey, well, where is it? And like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. So, I don't know. Another thing I want to just mention about like Miguel's case. So during the trial, uh, there was a lot of legal turnover. So he would be getting new lawyers all the time. And some of the lawyers that like he ended up getting were lawyers that were involved in like his one of six like confessions that he gave. So like each time he would get a new lawyer and it was like, oh, that lawyer was also present in his second convention or confession. And then he'd, he'd like ask for a new lawyer. So they'd give him another lawyer and that lawyer would be like a lawyer from his third confession. So he just kept on asking for new lawyers and like trying to get a fair trial, which I guess he never did. His final lawyer. Um, so he had seven lawyers throughout this whole like trial. And then for his final one, it was like four years after the discovery of the bodies and his defense only had four months to prepare for the trial. Mm. They also like had appointed a lawyer just in case that final lawyer would were to drop out so they were just like ready to move along with the case even if he kept on petitioning petitioning for like new people and that he wasn't being given a fair trial mm. yeah and that's kind of what happened he, he went to trial they didn't have any dna ev evidence they didn't have uh any weapon or crime or anything that linked him to the case other than his confessions and the and then he was still like charged and sentenced to prison right and that's kind of the story there. And I did mention that he was released 
in 2013. So he was in, in prison for 21 years. And then when he got outside of jail, he was greeted by journalists who wanted like first words from his mouth. He refused to speak and he made his way to a nearby train station. So apparently while working in prison, he had roughly 2,000 euros. So he took a train to a nearby town, getting off before his ticketed destination. From there, he got into a car with two unknown individuals and he went off to Madrid. He did record one single phone interview after his release in which he stated that he was innocent of the crimes he was convicted of. He accused the prosecution of setting him up for these crimes, and then he was like never heard from again. And even to this day, no one has a positive notion of where Miguel Ricard is. There's some rumors that have stated that he found religion in prison and has dedicated yeah. his life to working in a French monastery where judgment is reserved for God above. So he kind of disappeared as well. Yeah, I thought that was also crazy that he's might be like a monk now. Yeah. It's like, what the fuck is going on? But it's just crazy. Like the entire case, um, just how how big it got and how police are able to just like charge who they want to charge and just kind of leads up to it. Also, like yeah. such faulty uses of like eyewitness statements to like put people where the they weren't essentially or like coercing people or just all the things that we talked about before, like botching from the recovery of the bodies to the autopsies to like the stories and confessions they got. Everything was just very uh, sketchy, essentially. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, that's the that's the case of the Alcacer murders. And yeah, you want to go final thoughts? Yeah, let's do it. I'll ask uh, you. So okay. do you think it was Miguel and Antonio were the only two involved or like were the people that perpetrated the crimes? It's so hard to say. I think initially I believe there was some statements that there was four men in the car when the girls yeah. got in. So it's hard to say who, but you know, two of them could have laughed at some point or something. I, I, I don't know if I'm leaning with my gut, I think there's clearly more to the story, but we have no way of knowing. I think that Antonio guy is definitely involved. Yeah. I think that Miguel guy was probably involved. I don't know if he actually did the murders, but I think he was involved and knows. I, I just, I just think that I, I, I don't know the other people who, who knows. Yeah. I have the no other idea. Thing, uh, the other big conspiracy theory with this is many people believe that Antonio, like after being released on his six day pass, from prison he died and oh yeah he doesn't exist yeah yeah, he doesn't exist so the police just used that whole story it, to like make make the story that they want work so because and that's like, that's a that's an interesting theory but he has family right who corroborate that he's a real person yeah they they do say that he's a real person but like from the time of his release like nobody had seen him for a year and then, like, his arrest warrant is issued in September. The girls go missing in November. But all of that could have been, like, retrospective, too. Like, it's just... Oh, and shit. even, like, the whole six-day pass. Like, it just doesn't make sense for a repeat offender to get a six-day pass. And then just, That's like, crazy. Not, not be followed up with. Well, so, that would make yeah. sense for, like, the window-jumping stories and, like, how he's not dead and how he's, like, swimming in the ocean, like, jumping off a fucking boat. It's like, it's, if it's just fake, you know what I mean? Like, it just yeah. sounds so outlandish that it's, you know, treads in the territory of fantasy. It, so that would make sense. Yeah, and all those stories of, like, him being in Ireland or, like, him being on a boat, it's all, like, eyewitness statements. So it's just like, oh, they heard that he's... And even, like, with the eyewitness statements, it'd be, like, some people were saying he's, like, in Madrid. Others are like, oh, yeah, he's in Portugal and each time the police show up is just like no evidence. <laughs> there was also like even videos or like pictures of there was a statement saying that, oh, Antonio was staying at this hostel near Valencia. And then when the police show up, it's just like a crumpled up like blanket on a bed. And they had porn magazines, like 50 <laughs> porn magazines just on the bed. And that's like what gay they, porn. Uh, no, not gay, gay porn, like <laughs> straight porn for this one. <laughs> But it was just obviously it looked like so set up. 
before the picture was taken. Like Antonio, Antonio, Antonio's in the hostel jerking off. Get yeah. here. Yeah. So I that's why, like, <laughs> that's how involved I guess the cops were. Like, they just followed up on these false claims and staged pictures of like where that's he crazy. was, even though they know that he's been dead the whole time. Interesting. That's I mean, one of the big theories. See, I don't know. I mean, maybe you've convinced me. Maybe Antonio doesn't exist. Maybe uh, this is a secret cabal of Satan worshippers, and this was like some snuff film. But yeah, it kind of just feels to me like Antonio murdered them. Miguel is involved, and there might be some other people who know what happened, or maybe were there. But like, we have yeah. no way of knowing who they would be. Yeah, the hair, the hair follicles that were f- like could be. Like the other people that were in the car, because the eyewitness says there was four people, and one of them. So they think the four people were Antonio, Miguel, Antonio's brother, uh, Mauricio, and some other guy that they don't know the name of. They just call him El Nano. Uh, so that's who they think the four people were. But <laughs> El Nano, what the like fuck we've is already that? said, like the DNA from some of the hair follicles doesn't put any of them is that there. Like, is it like some kind of like weather system, like? El no, that's Nino. El Nino. Like, I'm, El, I'm El Nano. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, he's like a piece of weather. Yeah. In my personal opinion, I do think that, like, Antonio was dead after that six-day oh, pass. Oh, shit, really? And Miguel was involved, but it was probably like, I don't know if actually Miguel was involved. I think he just, yeah, I don't. I actually don't think Miguel was Whoa. involved at all. But, so, okay, how how do we know he's dead? Because, like, wouldn't his family have had a funeral? Like, wouldn't, like, like his well, brother be like, this guy's dead? Or what do you well, think? Well, the thing is, is, like, they thought he was in jail. But then it was revealed that, like, he had the six-day pass. They think he, like, never came home or whatever. Uh, no, so, so the they, family hasn't, like, been in touch with him. No, not since, like, he went to prison for, like, that 1991 kidnapping and imprisonment crime. So the only pe- person who we know who is in contact with this elusive man was McGill. Yeah. And even Miguel in his like first statement, he's like, yeah, I haven't seen him for like months. Like, even though we were friends for decades, like I, I just haven't seen him. So he's not around, but then the Jesus police are Christ. like, no, he is. And you were there with them. So I don't think these guys were oh, involved. Wow. Okay. I, okay. Think... I didn't see, I didn't pick up on that. Yeah. When my, in my research at all, what I think is like the media coverage of the event just got so big that the police just needed a scapegoat and needed somebody to like take the blame so they could like get the media off their backs. Just resolve. Yeah. Just well. resolve what's going yeah, like on. Like even the president was like involved in like looking for the case. So they just wanted a quick resolution. They found a local junkie that would take the, take the fall even through like co- coercion and torture. <laughs> and they just like make up stories. Yeah. Like that's, that's he jumped what off happened. the boat and swam away into the sea. We couldn't, we couldn't get him. He swam. They're like, they're like, didn't you go go arrest him? You know, he jumped out the window. Isn't it four stories high? He rolled. He pressed A button before he yeah. landed. He rolled. And like, <laughs> like okay. Yeah, it just that none of it makes sense. Yeah, none of it adds up. So that that's that's where I am. It's like unresolved. They never caught the people that actually did it. Ah, it's crazy. He's just like cartwheeling away. He cartwheeled <laughs> past me. <laughs> got like his dumbass perm that's like blonde dyed blonde or some yeah. shit <laughs> there's a lot more stories like each eyewitness account of where antonia was has like a story associated with it so like do your own research it's it's all out there but like yeah he's getting his hair dyed from blonde back to dark brown his natural color and then he like a few weeks later he goes back and dyes it because they found like a bottle of <laughs> blonde hair dyed next to the bodies as well conveniently so yeah (laughs) it's like so many so many of these stories like he had a friend in portugal that was like oh yeah he definitely stayed with me and then when they like get to the guy's place he's like oh no he just left you guys just missed him (laughs) yeah (laughs) Yeah. but it's all like junkies that have these like oh yeah he was staying with me but it's like somebody that's clearly a drug addict yeah yeah, so it's just yeah. like a, just a lot of yeah, not great. Yeah, no, um, like, no evidence. Yeah, integrity there. Okay, well, but that's also why I think like they fucked up like the autopsy and everything was because they knew that they didn't have a story, 
And if they didn't have any evidence, they could pin it on Miguel without. Oh, like, that's like why too the, much they of used a, the beekeepers. Yeah. And the, that's so stupid, though. So that way they could blame somebody else for like if evidence was destroyed. It's like, oh, the beekeepers put it in plastic bags like and then you know, it destroyed yeah, the evidence. For sure. For sure. I understand that. But like that, that from that emerges, there must be a motive for wanting to not solve the case the way you would like it to be solved. Because like you would like, you know, what I mean? like even before the media blows up, like the police wouldn't just be like. Oh, let's. We need a scapegoat for this case because you don't know anything about the case. You'd yeah. only need a scapegoat if, you know, like someone was involved with power that was like, we yeah. need to pin this on some. You know what I'm saying? So like, I'm not it, sure. it complicates things. <laughs> I think it was just like all the local people were in over their heads. I mean, it's a town of like seven thousand people, so they get all this like national attention. They start freaking out. They start like destroying evidence, fucking up. And the other thing um, that I was gonna say. Oh, yeah. Like the whole thing of like the judge was there for the bodies. He also like the secretary he brought becomes the judge on the trial. Like all the lawyers that are appointed to him were like people yeah. involved in the trial as well. So it's just like everything stacks up to being to it being like a hush hush situation where they're just trying to like silence any anybody that was outside of the case just to like push this through trial, put him in jail close up and the story and be done with it because yeah. most of the I, families like wanted to be out of the spotlight it was just fernando that was like still pushing for the truth and doesn't believe it i understand that but what i don't understand is the initial like why would you wash the bodies they're not even there's not even national attention at that point like you don't need to wash the bodies i think there so was what I'm saying, national attention like the president had spoken christmas eve and then january 27th so like a month later oh sure sure them. so okay yeah. okay so sure honestly i think it was just like sure somebody it was like their first autopsy they're like i'm just gonna wash the body they're like no you, the idiot, most you can't do case. that yeah and he's like oh shit Jeez. now we have to cover this up it's just like yeah. a lot of incompetency of like the local task force that was An antonio did it he was yeah. just here he washed yeah. the body and laughed yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> but crazy story I don't know if I have anything else to say about it. That is crazy. Okay. Well, see, so I don't even know what I think anymore. But yeah, let's let's roll out of this one. So I do want to say to listeners, I have, well, two things. First, Patreons. We are giving out these holographic stickers. Some of you, we owe holographic stickers to that are Patreon exclusive, but I don't have your address. I've messaged everybody on Patreon, so if you're listening to this, check those messages, and uh, once you get us your address, we will send you out that sticker pack. Secondly, on the topic of sticker packs, we still have sticker packs we're giving out to general listeners who leave a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. So that's very, basically, if you want to support the podcast and help us out in a way that's, that's easy and you want sick, dope, weatherproof stickers we send out a sticker pack of three weatherproof stickers uh for leaving a, a review on spotify or apple podcast you just have to dm us a screenshot of that and you're we'll mail them out to you for free they're cool and uh, if you want to see what they look like you can follow us on instagram twitter and um facebook because we post drink posts with these stickers all the time is it do we have other things to mention yeah um if you do want to interact with us, we do have a website. So it's the swervepodcast.com. And they'll, there you'll find like links to all of our episodes of di different platforms. You'll see cover art. Uh, you'll also see a form there that you can fill out and give us like a drink or topic recommendation. So that just helps us centralize things. So you can also DM us your drink or topic recommendation. But I also encourage you to utilize the website for that. I'll, I will mention just our Patreon again. If you've enjoyed this episode, there's more episodes that are exclusive to Patreon. So for just $1 a month, so that's about three cents a day, you can get access to those ex exclusive episodes and the entire library that we've recorded so far. And then if you want to spend a little bit more, there's a $3 slap that ass tier, and that'll give you um, access to those bonus episodes, shout outs on the podcast, and you'll also receive all the episodes that we release a few days before anyone else. So you'll receive them on Sundays rather than the typical drop time of Wednesdays. Right. 
and you get a dank holographic sticker pack if you join that slap <laughs> if you the join ass that, the slap, yeah. yeah exactly okay um i think that's really all we have to say here i guess with that slap that ass and ride the wave <laughs>